Yes. Thank you for invitation. I don't know if I have to be suspicious because you invite me today. That is the day of the Befana, which in Italian, in Italy, is you know the witch who takes the gift to the kids. <laughs> so I said, "Oh, Oda, thank you for." <laughs> so today I'm the witch. I'm the <laughs> but. You know, women are all a little bit witches all the time. So, I mean, you, I don't think you're a witch, but you are definitely bringing us a gift by joining us <laughs> this evening. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, uh, yeah, I see people started to log in and say, and say hi. So I say hi to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to get uh, this conversation thanks to this technology that allow, allowed us uh, finally to stay home but still uh, meet uh, um, in, the, in the air. So that's fantastic. I like it very much. And um, so <laughs> absolutely not a Varolo witch, uh, Tony. Right. Thank you, Tony. Mwah! Love you. <laughs> All right, so, <laughs> well, first uh, I need to drink a little bit <laughs> to, no, uh, I, have, I started to tell you something about my story. Uh, I'm, I think uh, many, many people knows or, uh, now my story because I'm not uh, so young anymore. And so there has been, uh, many, many talking, many, even a movie, you know, the Barolo Boys, about the, the beginning of, uh, of my story, that is also the beginning of the story of, of many other winery. So, uh, so what's happened is that uh, uh, I, um, I, I have, uh, I come from a family of winemaker, uh, you know, my family owned the, the Borgogna winery for nine generations. But as you know, uh, women has never been supposed to take over the wineries uh, because uh, in the past, uh, women were supposed to get married and leave the family. Uh, but it's also true that in this area, you know very well that there are more girls than boys. So, especially in the wineries. So at a certain moment, uh, uh, the old guy had to give up of these rules. Uh, but uh, back then I was uh, really uh, the first uh, probably to break uh, this, uh, this rule. And uh, already in the eighties, uh, I was um, starting, you know, um, when you are in your 20s you start to uh, to really think uh, what you want to what you want to be before you don't know we say you are no fish no meat but little by little and especially to the family um, you get more uh, um, cautions of uh, what you are and uh, where uh, what you want to be so I have to thank my parents because they grow me up like uh, all the children of winemakers and or wineries proper proprietors. Uh, you know, the, the kids are always involved in work, in the, um, in the vineyard, uh, especially during the harvest, uh, because in the harvest uh, we need to have as much help as possible. So even the kids are welcome. Uh, well, in the past, now it's uh, forbidden for law, but in the past was very different. And, uh, and also in the cellar, I remember I was uh, giving a help uh, for all the different aspects of the work, but uh, never been involved in the winemaking really, as I told you, because the women were not supposed to take over the winemaking. And also because uh, the winemaking, especially in the past, has always been a very heavy, heavy work, you know, you really need uh, a lot of muscles. It's only more recently that uh, we have acquired um, equipment and uh, other stuff that can uh, help us uh, to avoid the muscle, muscle work. Um, and, but uh, back then was uh, very, very hard. Anyway, so 
I grew up in a winemaker family and for me it was kind of natural. Oh, hello? Hello, oh, I can hear you. Oh, I'm okay. Uh, so uh, for me, it was natural to to be proud of my family and uh, and the work, and so I really wanted to be a winemaker. But uh, but I couldn't be part of the wine of the winery of my family winery. So uh, from a bad the bad thing, sometimes comes good thing. So the owner of this uh, small winery, Pira, um, this uh, famous uh, Gigi that uh, was uh, a very um, a real patriarch, patriarch, I don't know if you can say this word. Yeah, you so can. one, yep, yeah, okay, patriarch of the Barolo. So, and he was um, very good, was, uh, uh, was actually very popular because uh, um, um, because it was uh, already recognized for for his ability, and he was the last one producer who crushed the grape by feet. And the journalist Veronelli was really in love with his wine, but uh, unfortunately, he died at the age of sixty-four. And uh, he, um, which would we would say now, still young, and. Um, he left uh, two sisters with no uh, knowledge, uh, deep knowledge of the winemaking. Uh, and so they asked my family, as, uh, because they are, were friends, to, to support them and to help. And my father and my older brother Cesare back then uh, did all the work for one year in the vineyard in the cellar. And so the, the two sisters were so happy for that that they didn't have, you know, the, the problem because uh, uh, the winery is not, uh, it's not a house or an apartment that you can shut the door. Uh, and so they offer my parents, my parents to take over the winery. And of course, my parents had already a winery. And so at this point, I really started to get in into the bit into the discussion and uh, I, um, I wanted uh, to and I I said to my parents that my dream was to make wine and that would have been fantastic a small winery for me if they support me if they help me and they did um, my parents did uh, the support uh, from uh, from the fact that uh, uh, of course the winery was already uh, had value and uh, we had to make a very big mortgage so um, without them uh, I wouldn't had the money to take over the winery uh, and my older brother help uh, in the in the cellar so uh, but this uh, went on uh, uh, for and so I was able to take over even if I was very very young at the, that age so I had to finish my studies I also had an experience of work outside uh, outside the house and then uh, I came back uh, and uh, took over uh, when I started my career uh, at the end of the 80s the beginning of the 90s I have to say that uh, um, I was very lucky because, you know, the movement of the Barolo boys started. So I met uh, Elio Altare, of course, uh, your good friend. Um, Silvia was not even on. <laughs> she was a child <laughs> at the time. And uh, uh, <laughs> Clerico, Giorgio Rivetti, so many a uh, great winemaker that uh, become also good friend. And together we started this big uh, brainstorming for uh, what, where we want to go. And so I learned a lot from them because I remember that we were always getting together, drinking great wine of the world and trying to compare to our Barolo. So we took cautions of the fact that we had in our hand like a... Um, Come si dice? Un, un diamante grezzo, a raw, raw diamond, you know? Mm. Uh, so what we need uh, to do was to make it shine. And uh, we realized that uh, we had to go in the direction of increasing the quality of the grape because the wine comes from the grape. 
and uh, we all had very good vineyards, but we reduced the crop. And back then was a shock for the people because as you can imagine, people, the, the people that was coming out from the war and they still had this concept of the quantity, you know? So mm -hmm. reduce and cut down the grape was a shock for everybody. Now, everybody does it because it's the only way to make a high quality grape and so high quality wine. Um, and then uh, this was the first thing. Then we invest a lot also in the cellar. So in the movie, there is uh, a funny uh, introduction of Sylvia that was uh, describing the grandpa uh, cellar with the chicken, with the gasoline, the car <laughs> and everything, the sausages. So we invest in the, in the cellar and uh, making, making them very efficient, very clean and also very beautiful. So we invest a lot of money in uh, getting equipped uh, properly and also in uh, getting new barrels. So uh, the, in the past, uh, again, people didn't spend money to buy new barrels. So certain barrels were really too old and uh, sometime also they could give some defect to the wine. So it was very important to have new wood. And, uh, uh, but uh, I think that what, um, uh, what was the greatest idea of uh, our movement uh, was the idea to vinify separate the single crew. And I remember Elio, one of these lessons, because he was fanatic of Bur Burgundy and he was already going to Burgundy in many, many years ago. And he was telling everybody about this concept of the crew. And he was saying, okay, we, we, our tradition is to put the grape all together, but uh, you, we should actually make separate the single crew to see the difference. And so we started. Uh, and uh, I think this inspiration was very important. Today, I think we have cohabitate the two soul of the Barolo interpretation as a single crew, but also again, like the traditional, in the traditional way, as an assemblage and both uh, are very good and very uh, interesting and uh, provide very interesting, interesting wine. But back then it was, uh, and it was new, was uh, a, a new idea. And of course, for producing small, small quantity, we had to go to smaller barrels. Uh, even today, I think that everybody uh, invest maybe in barrels that uh, even if they don't use barrel, but they use smaller barrel compared to the past. And so, uh, so we started to, to introduce a smaller barrel as well. Uh, I think that uh, these, the years uh, uh, of the 90s were very important to experiment a lot in, um, in, in, in working in this direction of the interpretation of the wine in single crew uh, and uh, in, a, in, a, in a work in the cellar very, very clean in order to express the character of the single vineyard. I think this was the most innovative idea that we went through um, in, in this path. And, um, and so for me, it was uh, so exciting because uh, I like uh, all the news, the, the new idea, I like to try, I like to experiment and I still do it now. So um, when there are new ideas, I always try because uh, you can never say is wrong or is right if you have not tried yourself. What is funny is that some people say, oh no, it cannot work. It cannot work because you think so. Why don't you try? And then you will see. And uh, what new ideas are you trying? Uh, I'll tell you later. It's a long, uh, <laughs> it was gonna be my question too. What are you new trying? Idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there are many, many things that we are going through. So for example, one is to avoid completely the sulfite, even if I do natural wine. So the level of sulfite are very, very low. You know, the maximum sulfite for natural wines are 100 milligram. 
per liters and we are around 30. So if you think that naturally the wine express 20 milligram, it's really nothing. But for the moment, uh, in order to protect the wine from oxidation, we have never tried anything else uh, uh, than uh, the sulfite, which is actually the only thing we add to the wine. All the, uh, there is nothing, nothing else we add to the wine. So it's really very pure vinification. And um, we are working on this, uh, on this side to avoid completely the, um, the use of sulfite. And then of course, uh, I try, I don't know, um, people now follow the fashion of the whole bunch. So I try several uh, vinification with different degree of whole bunch. I want to see, I want to see how is the result. And uh, uh, so there are many, many things. And um, of course, uh, um, there is no, no end to the dreams, you know, there are always new, uh, new idea to try. And, uh, and that is the things that makes uh, exciting your work because then otherwise, you know, the work has to be very um, constant. Uh, when, in your opinion, what? <laughs> I don't read all the Yara, questions. stay anyway. on topic. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All these questions uh, kind of distract me. <laughs> okay, you will do the question at the end. You read the question and tell me later. Hmm? I will. I will do the okay. question. And it, just to the people watching, if you do the Q and A, I will make sure that uh, that we answer your questions. I promise. But so we're talking about you. We're now talking about sulfites, and we can answer this question. So, what's the problem with sulfite in the wine? Uh, of course, the sulfite is not good for health. And uh, it's true that there are a lot of uh, food, even food, like the meat or other things that had uh, a lot of sulfite, much more than the wine. And a certain wine, especially the white or um, certain wine, um, have a high level of sulfite, and this is not good. So uh, that's why I want to take it uh, completely out, if uh, possible. So I'm trying. Hmm? Anyway, to go back to the story, uh, so I was uh, the only woman in this group of boys, uh, and that's why I was called the Barolo girl of the, uh, you're the Lange girl, I was the Barolo girl in a group <laughs> of Barolo boys, and it was very exciting and very nice. Uh, I think that today this uh, taboo, this uh, thing is broken, and there are a lot of girls that study, many, many generations of smart girls has come behind, and uh, are doing great thing in the winery today and is actually a movement that cannot be ignored any anymore and more and more girls are actually so active in the wineries but back then uh, i was uh, really an exotic fruit uh, for the fact that uh, there were no women in the winemaking let's say, because the wine make, the, the women in all society are the column. And even here, women has always been so important to keep the family, to work in the vineyard, to keep the finance. A lot, a lot of aspects that has been covered, has always been covered by women. So today, there are even more work that are covered by women, which is, uh, for example, the marketing. The girls are very smart. They study languages there. And, uh, and also many, many girls are studying enological school. For example, I have three nieces and two are studying uh, enological school and are already helping in the cellar. And uh, it's really, for me, is a joy because uh, um, that is really the, the parity. How do you say parita? The, uh, uh, the, the same, you know, girls, women and, and men are really the same in this case. But back then it was, uh, was strange. 
And so, uh, but I was happy. For me, there was uh, not only the desire to become uh, successful and uh, to produce uh, great wine, but there was also this, uh, um, this other idea, you know, to demonstrate that uh, being a woman I was able to make the work uh, as, a, as a boy, as a man. And, um, and then uh, I think that this movement uh, has been very important to create interest to an international, uh, to an international level. So people get more and more interested in Barolo, started to come over. And today, for example, we have uh, really a lot of people that come in the Lange to enjoy the wine. And there are more and more wineries, more producer that are showing and growing uh, well, you know, in the direction of quality. So today the panorama of winemaking in the area is really various and very exciting, at, uh, absolutely. But, but so, not, not to interrupt you, but you said something earlier that I found really interesting because um, today, you know, a lot of people, they are like the modernists, they use barrique and oak and the traditionalists, they use the big barrels, but you said something about the new oak that was interesting. You started using it um, to to be more clean with the wine, or to avoid. Yes, yeah, of course, because the older, very old, there were barrels in the wine in all winery. There were barrels that were fifty years old or hundred years old. So. And because in the past it was not easy to clean the barrel like today, because we didn't have the water, we didn't have the, all the instruments that we have today. Uh, there was also, you could find a lot of wine, and I'm talking about the 90s, uh, a lot of wine that were a little bit uh, stinking or animals, you know. People like even then, we were looking for more fruit, we were looking for more purity, more freshness. And so the idea was to have uh, new, new wood. So it happened that we started to buy barrique because, of course, uh, we uh, were vinifying single crew in small quantity. But uh, for example, today, I, a lot of winery, uh, they have uh, that they keep on using big barrels, but they are, if you go in all the wineries, you will find barrels that are new or, or kind of new, you know, bought it in the last few years. So people get rid of the very, very old uh, barrels. And I also bought a bigger barrel because today making the, uh, the assemblage as a Via Nuova is possible actually to have, uh, uh, to manage a um, more quantity of wine. So I, today I use both bigger barrel, but not big, big. They are only 2000 liter. Uh, so bigger barrel and smaller barrel in order to have a perfect balance of the wood because the wood is an instrument and is always important is only important is only is important to um, let the wine age properly so that's the 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 goal of the of the of the wood let the wine age properly without giving taste of wood so that's why it's very important also the combination of the size and the, uh, and the age of the, of the barrel. So, um, so there is always uh, a turnover, of course. There is always an introduction of uh, some new, new wood, but Did you disappear? Oh. Uh, sorry, I was kicked out for a moment. <laughs> I don't know why. Well, Probably because in, in Barolo, connection is bad. But so the reason I ask is that once you said to me, you know, uh, I use oak, but I don't like the taste of oak, uh, which I think is a very good point because I think there's a misconception about using barrique and newer barrels. It means it tastes like oak because in my experience, it doesn't have to. Yeah. Exactly, it has not to, yeah, you don't have to taste of wood because for me it's a defect. If you have a wine that tastes like wood, it's a defect. 
So uh, it's very important that the wood is used in a very light way. So what I want to do is to show the, the, the difference and the character of the vineyard. So you cannot cover the, this uh, fruit, this perfume, this elegance with the, with the vanilla or the coffee or uh, with the, the shit that the wood gives. Okay. So it's very important to have great, uh, the perfect grape and to vinify in a very clean, in a very pure way. But then you don't want to waste it, put it in, in, uh, in wood that give taste. Uh, in the past, uh, maybe the woods were too old and they were giving a uh, bad smell, but also the new wood give a bad smell because the new wood is also a bad smell, smell or taste, <laughs> whatever. So, but so, so I don't know if I clear the concept. You, you, you are, but you, you, I, I don't even have to be here. You can just talk the whole time. <laughs> um, but so, so it's already 7.30. So I think we should talk about the two wines that we are tasting together. And then we, sh we have to talk about your Barolo, obviously. But tell us a little bit about your Barbera. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, of course, I make six wine. Uh, of course, our pure blood horse uh, uh, is the Barolo, which I declinate in three versions. So two single crew, Barolo Cannubi, the most glamorous, Barolo Mosconi, that is the new star, right, rising star, and the third Barolo, that is an assemblage of six plots uh, divided in three villages. Uh, so this is the more classic interpretation of Barolo, which is at the moment very successful. And actually, you know, I got a very, very high score for this wine with the 2016, and I'm very proud uh, of, uh, of the fact that uh, this wine uh, succeeded so much. So this, uh, but beside the three Barolo, which are the most important, we, uh, we produce the three classic, uh, typical uh, wine of the Lange, which are the Dolcetto, Barbera, and Lange Nebbiolo. Uh, I tell also a few words about the Dolcetto because I think we are, um, we are going to have a sort of rebirth of the Dolcetto, which has always been uh, the everyday wine, very simple wine uh, for, for us, but, uh, and all, always a little bit forgotten, but, uh, and for this reason, many winemakers took away the vineyards or they produce with not so much attention. And so I think that uh, even the Dolcetto is uh, a little pearl in, uh, in, the, in the crown where of course, as I told you, the Barolo are, are the diamond, but, uh, but it's all uh, surrounded by, by beautiful pearls and Dolcetto is a beautiful pearl. Then the Bar Barbera, uh, is, uh, you know, like uh, a bridge between uh, the, the fresh and fruity dolcetto, uh, more uh, like uh, an everyday wine, uh, toward the, the Nebbiolo, which is the most important and the most uh, structured uh, uh, wine and varietal as well. So Barbera is absolutely a great wine. I think it is uh, so... Uh, Polyed polyedric uh, because um, can be of course interpreted as a fresh fruity wine but can age also beautifully and is a wine that thanks to the fact that doesn't have tanning so uh, hard um, but it has a very refreshing acidity uh, is a wine that is perfect with, uh, um, with a lot of food and with for a lot of event and everybody likes it. So it's really a wine that is beautiful to, uh, to kick in uh, a dinner or whatever, um, or even an aperitivo, a glass of Barbera. When you offer Barbera, everybody likes it. And it's a way to warm up the situation in order to arrive to the Langenipiolo. 
<laughs> so Barbera, it's a really beautiful, it's a really beautiful wine. And in these last years, we have Barbera with a lot of structure uh, because of course, Barbera uh, has to be in very good position. And, um, and in this year with the global warming is, um, is getting very high level of maturation and so very high level of alcohol as well. Uh, but uh, has, of course, uh, a lot of fruit on the other side. So it's a wine that uh, can really be appreciated young uh, or, and also age uh, beautifully. Um, we make a Barrera Superiore, so uh, it means that uh, we put it on the market with one year of aging in barrels. Not new barrels, old barrels, but uh, it goes in, uh, in barrels for one year. And uh, this gives a little bit more stability to the wine uh, because uh, it, um, it let it grow older a little bit. So I think that Barbera um, with the one year of aging minimum uh, really give you great, great satisfaction. But so, so uh, Barbera, what are your favorite uh, dishes together with the Barbera? What would you eat with Barbera? Well, you know, Barbera has uh, a beautiful acidity, uh, has a very high acidity. So Barbera is perfect with all fat food because the acidity degrees your mouth. For this reason, for example, in Piemonte, we have a fantastic dish that is almost disappeared because it's too, it's too complicated to make it. It's the fritto misto. And so Barbera with the fritto misto is perfect. But you know, we have also very good uh, uh, salami, salumi. And uh, salumi are, are a little bit fat. So uh, Barbera is perfect with salumi. Sometimes you just need a good salami and a glass, and a glass of Barbera and, and your evening is done. Uh, but uh, I like it also with uh, with the cheese. You know, I'm part of this project in Des Martins. We make uh, we have we produce cheese, and uh, we have the Castelmagno, and also we have uh, other cheese uh, that are perfect with the Barbera because of the fatness, again, of the cheese. I like Barbera very much, even with the bollito, which is, uh, you know, bollito is another important dish, uh, very complicated because it, uh, uh, it involves many pieces uh, um, of meat. Mm, but again, uh, I love Barbera also with the, with the bollito. So I had What's your favorite that combination? So I, I often have it with the, with the, in, in Christmas with Norwegian Christmas food because the side dishes in Norwegian Christmas food is very fatty. But today I had it with the lasagna. Okay. Yeah, but it's a passepartout. It's a wine that really uh, get uh, with, um, with uh, a lot of food. It's, very, it's really a perfect wine for food. So we, we talked a little bit about barrels and you put your Barbera in, in, in barrels, but uh, you don't, you, you said you don't use new barrels. No at all for Barbera, nothing. No, I like the fruit. I like the fruity. So uh, the, bar the, the barrel has to be as neutral as possible. Like for all the wine, of course. Well, Dolcetto even don't make any aging in, um, make even no aging, but also the Barolo. As I told you before, it's very important that uh, the, the barrels are as neutral as possible to let the wine breed, to let the wine age, which is the goal of the barrel. But of course, cannot be neutral because, you know, the glass is neutral, but a barrel, is not, cannot be completely neutral because it was a tree, was a living thing. It's like a little bit the cork. So, okay, we accept that, but of course we try to have it 
and neutral. For this, it's very important to use uh, older barrels. And now on 80%, uh, also the Barolo, I use most of the are used the second, third, or first touch, and for the Barbera as well. No, no, at all, no new wood. But today, we are able to clean the barrel so efficiently that even an older barrel can be kept and uh, we can make a manutention, you know, to the, to the wood, the perfect, uh, very perfect. So even an older barrel, we never had uh, um, sediment, residual of sediment or um, defect. If you clean it very well, you go back to the pure wood. And so that is perfect for our goal. So while we're on the, on the subject of wood, which uh, I'm sorry we talk so much about oak and wood, but when you make your barolos, do you choose? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it's, you know what? The, the wood is the less important thing. It's just a tool, you know? It's like, for example, when you cook, use a little bit of salt, but salt is not the substance of the, of the dish, you know? It's just something that can uh, uh, help uh, maybe, but the ingredient is the real thing. So for the wine, the ingredient is the real thing, is the grape. And because we do organic farming and I do a lot of work, I tell you, a lot of work in the vineyard, that is my favorite aspect. Uh, I don't care about the wood. I don't want to <laughs> talk about the Anyway, ask me what you about the vineyard because <laughs> I, I'm okay with the with the wood. Go ahead. So, what do you want to know? One question: Because you make three different Barolo, uh, do you use sort of a different type of combination of wood for the different Barolos, or is it the same? Okay, so for some years I've been doing exactly the same because uh, the vinification is made the same. The goal, the idea was uh, to express the vineyard in, at his best, you know? So, can you be more elegant? And I wanted, I said, okay, let's do exactly the same for all the three wine, so that uh, all the differences cannot be uh, imputated or cannot be given to the winemaking, but only to the grape. But you know, as I told you, the wood is, uh, the, the aging in wood is important, but is not the ingredient. So at this point, uh, I realized that uh, at a certain moment by tasting, I realized that, uh, um, so what I was doing, half big barrels and half small barrels. But with the, with the time passing by, I realized by tasting, that this uh, was unfair to the wine. So the vinification is still exactly the same for all the three wine, but the wood use is slightly little bit the difference one to another in order is, uh, it's really mm, a little bit like, uh, I don't know, the dress you put on, a color that can get better with your skin, you know, it's something that, has to make you look better. So, and the wood is the same. So, uh oh, did she disappear again? Chiara. Oh, come back. Oda? Yes. Sorry, I was kicked out again, but I mean. <laughs> Okay, so uh, what's happened is that I realize which is the most elegant, uh, doesn't go well in the big at all. And so but, uh, today, uh, Kanubi goes uh, only in the bigger barrel. Uh, Mosconi, on the contrary, because it has a big, powerful body, need the most, need the more which is a balance uh, 
Uh, part is in barrel, can, is smaller barrel, part is in bigger barrel. Uh, 